Okay, good to see all of you back here. Um, tonight we're going to talk about the formation of the Lutheran Confessions and also uh, Luther's later life. That these two things sort of coincide with, uh, with one another. And um, just so we get our bearings in terms of dates, as well as uh, Lutheran Confessional documents. So Luther's catechisms, of course, are the earliest, followed by the Arthur Confession and the Apology. So by uh, 1537, you notice all, almost all of them are finished. And then, of course, you have a big lag of about 50 years. And then, uh, bam, formal concord. Well, why is that? Well, because, as we'll see, there were lots and lots and lots of debates. Uh, that would be kind of the bulk of our uh, discussion this evening. And it may get a bit abstract. I'll warn you about that. But I'll try to simplify it as much as uh, conceivably possible. Now, uh, last time when we stopped off, uh, we were talking about the first Diet of Schwer, where the emperor is being enclosed upon by the Turks, and so he must come to a kind of agreement with the Lutherans, saying, okay, uh, enforce the Edict of Worms, but do it according to your conscience, which means don't do it at all. So, oh yeah, kill the Anabaptists. <laughs> Since uh, rebaptizing somebody from the fourth century onward in Roman law was um, a death penalty uh, because like, that was against the heretics of the Donatists in the church. And so, and of course, the uh, Anabaptists were political rebels. Um, they were uh, involved in, in, in lots of sort of violence. There were ones that were pacifists, but there were also ones that were involved in a lot of violence. So, that has something to do. so in the meantime, then, they're just like, okay, well, there is. Hopefully, uh, this great council, like the Council of Nicaea, uh, that Luther has always been appealing to since he began in his reforming activities, may come about. But in the meantime, let's just go about the work of reform in the areas that we kind of uh, control. Okay, and so then in 1527, then, you can see after a year after the uh, diet of, first Diet of Schwer, you get the Saxon visitations where uh, Melanchthon and some other people go out to visit the parishes uh, in the more rural areas to kind of see what's uh, going on. Well, not a lot that's good, right? Uh, nobody really knows much of anything, and of course, the priests are like semi-literate. Um, they ask them if they know the Lord's Prayer or the Apostles' Creed, and they say they're too old to memorize. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, was that hyperbole or was that legit? No, no, they were totally thought it was. I mean, most of these people are semi-literate. They can read the Mass, but that's about it. They don't preach really at all. Um, so, yeah. Preaching only became a thing, too, in the Middle Ages after the uh, 12th century. And that was one of the reasons the mendicant orders were um, formed, was to preach. But before then, there was no sermon. Uh, it would take maybe 20 minutes or half an hour to go through the liturgy of the Mass, and then you were, you know, off for your Sunday drinking, right? So, but... Uh, Anyways, yeah, so there was that problem, uh, really, really badly educated clergy. Um, they also had a problem that um, if you were a priest, you'd buy a benefice, uh, you'd buy your office, and then you get income from it, and then you use part of the income to pay somebody who was less educated than you, and then just keep them with the bulk of the money to, to do the work for you, right? So in the Anglican tradition, this continued on up until, I think, the early 1900s. So that's why, if you watch British comedies, the pastor is always called vicar, because the vicar is a stamp, right? So you get, a, so some people would get a benefice, and they'd be a professor at Oxford, and they'd be collecting money on this, and they'd hire a guy for the fraction of the money they were getting um, to, to do this for them. So he hadn't seen the the vicar, right? So that would be traditional in England. Too. So the funny thing is that they got rid, they got rid of that in the Catholic Church after Trent, but. The English were insulated from that, so they kept on the medieval sort of uh, tradition. So, um, anyways, so wow. not a good situation. And then, of course, there was a lot of you know gross immorality. And Luther um, felt that there was actually a deficiency in uh, the teaching of the law, and uh, said that we gave them the gospel and then they went to swine. So, and so uh, this has become part of the reason then for the formation of the uh, catechism. So. Here's the first edition um, of the small catechism. Uh, the model here is uh, the idea that uh, you uh, have a, uh, we might say, kind of leader's guide in the form of the large catechism, which a house father, since house, a household in the uh, early modern, early modern Europe, 
generally it wasn't just a nuclear household. It involved uh, servants and also uh, extended family and so forth. So you would have a, 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 a patriarch of the household. And he would be taught from the large catechism and then teach everybody else from the uh, small catechism. Uh, and this also was a way of uh, educating uh, clergy in these smaller areas uh, as well. And it's a, it's a very effective means of doing catechesis. The Roman Catholic model, is from, since the Reformation, has sort of been, let's create an enormous book which contains every tiny piece of information the faithful might want to look up. So the Roman Catholic Catechism goes on for, I think, like 1,500 pages or something like that, right? So, uh, but Luther's is very good because it's just the basics of the faith, and uh, uh, he records the teachings of the faith in various ways. If the nice little formulas, as of course I'm certain sure all of you realize since you read this book. Uh, and so it's, I think it's a much better uh, sort of uh, model than you would necessarily have within the Catholic uh, tradition. So, so one of, of course, many Reformation catechisms, catechisms became a really important part of spreading the faith at the time of the Reformation. In reaction is, of course, the Council of Trent, which will be the great reforming, but also sort of uh, counter Reformation. Uh, council of the Catholic Church will, will come with their own catechism, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which will be in use until the 20th century. And there were various reform catechisms, the Heidelberg Catechism, of course, being the most famous. It's one of the uh, three forms of unity uh, in the continental reform tradition, so people over at Catholic College have to sign on to it. Um, so, uh, and your, uh, in the reform tradition, it's customary to have a morning preaching service and then an afternoon catechism. Which in the old days was three hours in the morning, three hours in the morning, and three hours of catechesis in the afternoon. So, uh, not so much anymore, but. <laughs> okay, so these are some images for it. Thou shalt not kill. So this seems to be King and Abel here. And it says, Bas is das. And then the answer is, we should do it on film, right? So, Okay, so that goes on for a while, uh, and of course, uh, Luther and Melanchthon are at Wittenberg, trying to get people out to the parishes as quickly as possible. They oftentimes didn't give them the greatest education, since they didn't come out there quickly. Though one of the nice things was that the expectation wasn't necessarily to write sermons, so um, you could just read Luther's postals in this church service, and. Um, you just read out of a book. You didn't have to write out sermons. That was the practice of the Catholic Church until the 1960s. Priests didn't write the sermons. So, yes. So, so the, the apostles, they're incredibly long, some of them. Some I mean, of them, yes. The, one of the uh, Nativity, I think, is 135 pages long, which I don't think you'd preach that sermon. No. Well, they, I mean, these were really designed to help preachers write their sermons, right? Right. Originally, yes. But the expectation was that if you, you weren't smart enough to do that yourself, then you could just read. And this was not considered a bad thing at all. Um, oh, sure. <laughs> and in the Anglican Church, too, they have a, a book called the a Bishop's Book, which was simply a collection of sermons, which the expectation was as, as they would just send out to the parishes and then you'd just read that. Um, usually, you know, various moral lessons and all this kind of thing. So, um, yeah, so this wasn't considered bad. They had very different ideas. They, we like originality, so. Uh, and, and it doesn't feel sincere if, if the pastor didn't write their own sermon. They didn't really care about that. They also thought things that we would regard as plagiarism were perfectly all right. So, so um, I, I was just finished reading uh, Johann Gerhardt, uh, the Lutheran theologian, the great Lutheran theologian of the 17th century, his book on the method of theology, which he copies about a third of his copy word for word from a reformed uh, theologian named Francis Junius. So. Again, this is not plagiarism. They really yeah, but, uh, but we're copying from a reformed guy. That's mm -hmm. what I'm thinking. Well, I mean, modifies it. Pardon me? He modifies it. Oh, okay. And there, there's a, there, when we talk about Melanchthon, Melanchthon invents all Protestant systematic theology, so there's a common stock of concepts between the Lutheran and the Reform and the same method as well, so as we'll see. But, uh, okay, so we're, we're uh, doing reforming stuff, okay, and trying to reform the church the best we can, um, slowly and gradually. Um, Luther didn't like quick reforms, so he gradually turned Reformed the uh, the uh, church service, turning it over to the vernacular. In other, in, in university towns, he actually suggested that you keep it Latin because that way people could learn their Latin because that was the language of um, uh, 
law and the church and so forth. And so uh, he did the limited in every area. Um, and, you know, so a, a gradual changing over. Uh, and then finally, uh, we get to, to the second diet of Spain in 1529. Well, now the political situation has drastically changed. The Turks were going to invade Europe, but Suleiman the Magnificent, the uh, Turkish Sultan and the Caliph, uh, dies, and so they began to withdraw their armies. Well, the emperor doesn't need to negotiate with the Lutherans anymore, so he says, um, Edict of Worms fully reinstated 100%, okay? So, uh, and no more engaging in any reforming activity. Maybe there's going to be a council in, in the future, but hold everything you're doing. And don't, I know I can't technically reverse anything that's gone on so far, but, you know, you can't do anything else. So there is a formal protestation of this by all these people. I, don't, I can't, I'm not going to read them all And actually then, along with them, some Zwinglians, remember, um, we, we didn't have time in this particular lecture series to go into the, the reform tradition, but we have uh, people we would call reformed, in, particularly in the southern uh, German uh, city-states, and also in you know, Switzerland, arising this time, and, and they are also visiting these diets and um, talk and negotiating with the emperor about their own unique forms of reformation. So they protest the reinstatement of the Edict of Worms, and so they are now the, the label Protestant. So that's what Protestant originally means. It's just that you protested the reinstatement of the Edict of Worms. Now one guy in particular, Philip of Hesse, uh, uh, now gets uh, an idea in his head. Uh, the emperor is not going to let the reform go through ever. He doesn't have a lot of trust in the kind of future council. And so perhaps they should start forming a military alliance among the Lutherans for uh, collect the sake of collective security, you know, like NATO, right? So that if one of them is attacked, then all of them can kind of attack. Now, his, 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 this is a good idea. On the other hand, his motives very well might have been mixed. I mean, a lot of historians think that the goal was to leverage the Reformation to overthrow the emperor and then make himself emperor. Okay, so, by the way, all these people's motives are probably mixed. I don't doubt that they believed in Lutheranism. On the other hand, it is kind of interesting that during that period when the papacy was weakening and they negotiated with local kings about um, who got to choose bishops and so forth, the ones, the areas of Europe where the, the government had a say and who got pointed to the church offices, they were never interested in the Reformation, period. Even if some of their subjects were, like, for example, France. Areas where the, those deals didn't get go through, they were all very interested in the Reformation, right? So, mm -hmm. but, so a lot of it had to do with fund control and so on. Sure. I won't say, though, that is, in fact, the only motivation. People do things for a series of very complex motivations, multiple motivations. So it's not purely cynical. And by the way, they really do believe all this stuff. So. Religion is just not an option in the world view in the 16th century, as we'll see uh, when we get to the uh, English Reformation. Okay, so this then leads to uh, the Augsburg Confession, uh, which, is the, which is based on several other earlier documents. Okay, so Philip of Hesse wants to uh, create this military alliance, and so the military alliance needs to have a kind of common uh, confession of faith. So Luther and Melanchthon and a few other people meet at uh, Schwabach Hall to uh, write some articles up that could conceivably be a confession of faith for this military alliance. So that's one source. Uh, another source, of, and that happened, I, I, sh I should have reversed this because the Marburg articles were actually the first ones. Uh, Marburg articles are the first weeks of October um, of 1529. This is when the, with Philip of Hesse, who wants to form a military alliance, remember with those city-states, those Viglian city-states, those reformed uh, people in southern Germany? Well, he wants to, them to work out their uh, issues regarding the Lord's Supper and then baptism with the Lutherans, in particular the Lord's Supper. And uh, they go to uh, Marburg, sort of a Marburg colloquy, and they argue back and forth. They've been actually arguing for years at this point. Very, very, very nasty uh, polemics uh, against one another. Um, and uh, Luther, of course, shows up and um, basically points out that, you know, no matter what argument they're going to offer, they can't prove this is my body, doesn't mean this is my body. Right? He famously writes up with a piece of chalk uh, on the podium in front of him and covers it up just so that he 
um, can, can he knows that that's what he's supposed to focus on. It, but it's actually a good rhetorical strategy. If you can control the terms of any argument, then you'll automatically win. So this is what he was thinking about. So they were able to draw up uh, 14 articles. With the 14th article, um, the Lord's Supper is still in dispute. Um, the Zwinglians and the reform people in general kind of actually fudged it. You know, for example, it affirms that they believe in confession and absolution. Zwingli didn't believe in confession and absolution. So. Uh, and, but they just couldn't agree on what the issue of the Lord's Supper, and it says something like, well, we pray the other side will, you know, God will mind them and then make them believe what we believe or something along those lines. So, so that's one. Um, uh, that's one, another source. And then finally, of the Turgau articles, uh, finally the emperor uh, realizes that there's, he has a very serious problem on his hands, and so he's going to have to call a uh, diet at Augsburg to set, finally settle the religious uh, issue. And so um, the, uh, uh, the uh, Saxon royal family, uh, or the ducal family, I should say, uh, invites again Luther, Melanchthon, and uh, a few other people to um, uh, Torgau uh, to a, um, I think a monastery, and or an abbey, uh, to, which is where Mounts live, um, to write up these Torgau articles, which Melanchthon then has all these in hand, and so when he makes it then finally to Augsburg, um, by April, he is uh, taking these into consideration and writing and rewriting, and if you're interested in any of this, there's a wonderful book called uh, The Historical Commentary on the Augsburg Confession by a guy named Phil Hohenauer. Um, I mean, I don't really have the stomach for the textual criticism aspect of it, but uh, it's still a good book. Uh, so, anyways, I, I won't go into detail because I just find it. It gives me a headache, basically. Right? So, um, so, I won't bore you with that. But, anyways, okay, so finally, then, uh, we have the presentation of the Augsburg Confession before the Emperor in uh, June 25th, uh, 1530. Um, and it's, of course, uh, read out uh, by um, uh, uh, Jan Breyer, who is an uh, attorney from uh, Wittenberg. And uh, the emperor falls asleep because it's very hot, and he's a gigantic tongue which sticks out of his mouth. But he's not that interested, of course. So, uh, okay, so uh, the Augsburg Confession then uh, is presented, and it is then uh, given to the uh, papal theologians uh, who are there. And so they, they respond to it with the papal uh, confutation. Um, now, what are the contents of the Augsburg Confession itself? Well, first of all, you have the first 20 some articles, 21 articles, uh, which deal with positive affirmations uh, of, the, of, the, of the Lutheran princes, okay? And it's interesting, if you, if you note the pattern, they, the, the, the pattern is very, very uh, ecumenical. Uh, you begin with affirming the Council of Nicaea uh, and condemning the ancient heresy of the Church. And then we move on to original sin, which is again a, a, an account of original sin that says sin incapacitates us so that we can do nothing to earn our salvation. Um, Certainly, a position that St. Augustine would hold and the ancient Council of Orange uh, would hold as well. The Third Ecumenical Council uh, in Ephesus, of course, also condemned the ancient heresy which says we can earn our salvation called Pelagianism. And so, again, we have them. So, we have the first two ecumenical councils, then we have the Third Ecumenical Council affirmed. Moving on to the Son of God, we then have the Fourth Ecumenical Council, which said that Christ was one person and two natures affirmed. Okay. Um, and then I guess implicitly the teasing out all the, everything that means in the fifth and the sixth ecumenical council, uh, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, now, of course, the, the teaching on justification by faith uh, probably a lot of people in the ancient church wouldn't have quite stated it in, in those terms. But there are people, of course, uh, there is a Catholicity with faith, and there are people in the ancient church who talk about justification by faith, like Saint Ambrose and John Chrysostom and, and uh, so forth. Uh, and the ideas of church and ministry, the ideas of the invisible and visible church, these are all very standard Augustinian ideas. So what do we have in front of the first 21 articles? We have the ancient councils of the church in front, and the standard Western Christology, or Christology, theology, that was very heavily reliant on the theology of St. Augustine in the first thousand years of Christianity. Okay, so a, what Western Christian theologians would recognize as Catholic teaching. 
Then we go to the articles regarding um, reforms in the church. Now, again, notice that there's a very interesting pattern here. Okay, so for, uh, first in Article 22, concerning both kinds, the insistence that this, so these are the ones dealing with reform, uses that need to be reformed. So, concerning both kinds, communion in both kinds. In the Catholic Church, prior to the Second Vatican Council, uh, it was the discipline, okay, it wasn't a doctrine of the church, it was a discipline. A discipline in the Catholicism is something the church can impose on people, but you know, isn't that a necessary part of the, of the articles of faith? That uh, lay people only received the host. They did not receive the cup. That was for the clergy. Now, this was again part of the uh, uh, the, the Cluniac and then the Gregorian uh, reforms, reforms, scare quotes, in the uh, 11th century. Okay? Um, so they had removed the cup from the lady. In a sense, uh, their official rationale was people were afraid to spill the, bl the blood of Christ. Okay? But the actual reason seems to be something to, to the effect of showing that the church was higher than lay people. Okay? Marriage of priests, again, interestingly enough, an innovation of the 11th century. Interesting. Okay, so we're, we're still in the 11th century here. Um, so, again, as I was mentioning last time, the idea in the Roman Catholic Church uh, was that the that monks had been kind of the vanguard of the church, and so if you make a church of monks, then you will have a non corrupt church. It didn't really work out that way, of course. Um, you have uh, the idea of the, you know, the attack on the sales of, uh, of the mass. Again, that's, that's, that's something that started out during maybe the 11th or the 12th centuries. Um, confession, concerning confession, uh, dealing with abuses connected with confession, the idea of uh, penance and so forth. Distinctions of food, and the, the general impression of monastic vows, a general impression we get is, is largely a lot of these things are medieval innovations, particularly of the 11th century. Uh, during, again, the period of the Cluniac reform, or the Cluniac reforms and the Gregorian reforms, or sometimes called the Gregorian uh, revolution. So, the interesting implication here is, okay, so we have affirmed the Christianity of the first thousand years, and then where does Christianity go off track? What goes off track in the 11th century? That's, that, that's the interesting part, okay? So, that's the thing that fundamentally, I think, distinguishes both the Lutheran and also on the reform side, reform people make very similar kinds of arguments, from maybe the radical reformers like the Anabaptists, who their theory is the church goes off the track of Constantine. Okay? It's not, uh, because their understanding of the church is that it's an alternative society, okay? And once it becomes governmentally established, then it ceases to be supremely countercultural, and then it's really completely corrupt. That's not the position at all of Luther or Calvin, um, or Zwingli, interestingly enough. It's, it's, it goes off track with the idea that the church is a government essentially above the rest of uh, society. Um, and kind of one of my pet arguments is that any theology implicitly has a theory of church history. So, okay. And since we're a divided Christendom, of course, there's also, there's also the question of when did the church go off track? The Catholic Church has to answer the question too, and they'll say, with us. That's, that's, <laughs> we're, we're the problem, right? So. <laughs> There's actually a, a book that uh, came out in 2012 called The uh, Unintended Reformation, which argues that everything is terrible now, and it's all, all Luther's fault, essentially. So, uh, and he's like this uh, Roman Catholic uh, scholar at uh, Notre Dame, so he blames Luther for global warming as well. So, so, uh, he does, so. Uh, it's a complicated argument, but... So. Does it have to do with drinking beer or anything? <laughs> no, uh, Luther said that people were basically bad, and so that meant that once people became atheists, they assumed that the, the badness and the selfishness was natural, and so we should have capitalism, and capitalism caused the war. Uh, so. Wow. <laughs> so there you go. Now he uh, came when he spoke to Acton. And let's see, capitalism produced Notre Dame University, which the guy teaches that. Yeah. <laughs> There's all kinds of. Well, I mean, the funny thing is that the Catholic Church is on board with a lot of these sort of, I guess we could say, it's, you know, democracy and you know, secularity and things like that are good now. And that stuff is a byproduct of enlightenment, which he hates, so I'm not really following the art. I don't follow his argument, but I guess. Uh, anyways, he came to speak to Acton, and you know, he. Oh. Or he came to speak at Aquinas, and were, the, the Acton donors were there, and they 
went out to dinner with them afterwards. Uh, they didn't like the thing we said about capitalism. So. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the church went off the track in the 11th century with uh, the Gregorian Revolution. So, what's, what's the key? Go back to the Christianity of the first thousand years, the one based on the Ecumenical Councils, was sort of the standard Augustinian theology of the West. And this is all intended as a compromise. They, the wording of it is very, very ecumenical. Um, uh, surprising number of the articles are accepted by the papal um, theologians, uh, but other ones are, are not so much. Obviously, justification by faith isn't. So, N nothing negative is said about the papacy at all, or anything like that. Um, just generally, uh, fairly positive sorts of comments. So, so the response is then, of course, the uh, papal computation. The papal uh, theologians go through the Oxford Confession and they reject some articles. We won't go through everything they uh, reject, and they present their own case. They get up and they read um, the, their uh, refutation of the Oxford Confession before the emperor as well. And it's bad. It's really bad. I've read it. So if you can get it in a book called uh, Texts and, uh, or I say Context and Sources of the uh, Book of Common Word, um, they'll make arguments like, of course we can have communion in, in one kind. When David was trying to escape from Saul, he ate, just ate the show bread. Like, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> it, it's things like, and the Lutherans actually laugh. They start laughing a little in the brief, which is rather rude, but <laughs> it was really bad. Nevertheless, the emperor says, who knows nothing about theology, okay, it sounds good to me, you're refuted, now convert it up. <laughs> so the Lutherans are like, whoa, 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 no, 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 we want a chance to respond. He's like, well, you can respond, but you just can't have a copy of it. So anyway, so they never yeah. really wrote enough of it down, that they, that Melanchthon that is then. And the next year, able to write the Apology to the Oxford Confession, yet another one of our confessional documents. Luther himself, himself actually can respond as well, uh, because he, uh, writes uh, the Galatians Commentary in 1531, which is actually a response in part to the papal uh, confutation. Oh, by the way, and if you're wondering why is Luther there, well, remember Luther is still under imperial ban, right? So he's at Coburg Castle in the southernmost part of Saxony, because that's the only area that's not going to be arrested in Germany. And he's writing letters back and forth, really kind of furious, uh, but he's not getting better information uh, from. Uh, Melanchthon, nevertheless, he, 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 he approves of the Oxford Confession, says he would probably have done it differently, but he agrees with the content. And um, uh, he's given also the uh, apology, and he adds things to it as well. So in many ways, it's not just Melanchthon's uh, work, it's also Luther has made additions to this as well. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a good apology, not perfect. The section on justification, which is of course the most famous and the longest section, can get kind of tedious at certain points because he's trying to respond to every single argument that the um, papal computation makes. I, I, we're not incumbent in subscribing to the book country to agree with every exegetical argument either. Okay, well, if I said that, I can take that to the bank, right? Uh, so the sections where he argues that the Apocrypha is supportive of justification and not seeing the works righteousness, uh, I, I don't find those maybe the most convincing arguments myself, but. Uh, because that was the whole point of the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha does support works righteousness. That's why the Catholics wanted it, because it was their only text that could support works righteousness, right? So the Apocrypha is written at a time when the Jews are moving out from Palestine, so they can't get to the temple anymore. So how do you get your sins forgiven? Well, you come with, you do good works, so you can make up for sins that you can, basically. And then that's when it gets into the Apocrypha. Right? So, anyways. Okay, so the situation of nevertheless is desperate. Uh, the, um, uh, Lutheran princes know that the emperor is not really on their side, and there's all this uh, political pressure that's now kind of off of him. And so they gradually uh, start uh, really making plans for the possibility uh, of war. Uh, nevertheless, they also do hold out hope simultaneously for a future uh, council of the church that will be able to work everything out. And so they meet continuously uh, during this period, particularly under the leadership of uh, Philip of Hessel. And um, as a, not a uh, confession of faith necessarily, but as a possible uh, confession that they can, or not as a, necessarily as a, as a collective confession of faith, which they already have in the Oxford Confession, but as a uh, document they consider a <coughs> council that just doesn't really ever materialize. They have Luther can finally close the 
uh, small fault in particles uh, in 1537, uh, which uh, he was going to deliver at small fault. Uh, but unfortunately, he got kidney stones. So he was taken to small cult, and it had blocked his urinary tract entirely so that he didn't go to the bathroom for two weeks. Um, and uh, he, by the time he got there, they thought maybe he could, um, you know, maybe come out of it by the time he got there, but he didn't. And so they uh, tried to do a number of things to get out the kidney stones by like feeding uh, him horse dung, and, among other things. So they thought his body would have like, a really violent reaction spit out the kidney stones, but it didn't work, so uh, just made him all the more sick. So they sent him back in a carriage, the Duke's, the Duke, uh, Duke uh, John Frederick's uh, carriage, and it had springs in it, and it sprung him around and knocked loose, apparently, the kidney stones, right? So, uh, and so some uh, historians disagree whether or not he urinated uh, uh, 12 pints or 14 pints, but uh, nevertheless, he didn't die. He thought he was going to die. So in many ways, the small public articles are a kind of last will and testament. Yes, yes. Right. So, and he lived 10 more years, right, with that modern medicine. Um, actually, if you look at Luther's health problems, a lot of them would be solved if they went on a walk every day. But if you write 120 volumes of works, then you're not going to do a walking, right? So he's very overworked. So anyways, had heart attacks and dizzy spells and all kinds of things. Another problem, too, is that um, some people think that it made him septicemic, having all that um, you know, back, uh, you know, backup urine in his body, and so it might have actually damaged certain centers in his brain, which uh, dealt with controlling your emotions, which would explain why a lot of people was more violent and angry writings tend to be in the 1540s, so that's a possibility as well. So what else will Paul Lurie also about? Well, it's, it's Luther, Luther really wanted to write a confession and so this is his attempt at it. Uh, now, there are certain articles which, of course, only have been dealt with in the Oxford Confession, which is sort of a, a cursory comment on. He says, these are articles uh, about the Trinity, about the personal Christ. We don't disagree with the people uh, on the other side about these, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them. But the two main issues are uh, the role of the papacy, which he felt Melanchthon had, in many respects, sort of um, uh, danced around a bit, and uh, uh, the questions of confession and absolution. So the first half, basically, of, of these, uh, this section uh, deals with how um, confession and absolution, as it's taught by the medieval Catholic Church, is a form of basically spiritual and psychological abuse, and it's basically the snowballing of a really bad idea um, where, you know, as I was mentioning last time, you get the, he didn't understand, he didn't know, of course, all the background that I talked about. Is my baptism in the early church, but you get this idea that you have to do penance, and then there's all those problems attended with penance, and you can't really be certain if you've done enough um, penance, and so on and so forth, and so then you add on indulgences, and then all this jazz with the church, and it just keeps on ballooning into this more and more terrible uh, system, basically, that may, puts you in a position where you're constantly in a state of anxiety because you don't know even if you've ever done enough to actually get rid of your temple punishment, or you just simply are in a state of, like, uh, you know, kind of devil in care. Um, then the next section deals with the papacy, which he unequivocally uh, identifies with the Antichrist, um, and uh, makes a series of very interesting arguments about how, if you believe in a system of works righteousness, you basically need an authority who will prescribe the works for you. And so he finds the worst example of this the, the mass. The mass is an abomination. And it's an abomination because the thing that, as to quote the 20th century Luther theologian, Masasa says, is um, it, the, 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 the Lord's Supper is the gospel, and the gospel is the Lord's Supper. So the, this, un, this um, unequivocal self giving of Christ in the form of his body and blood with the promise of the gospel attached to it, uh, this unequivocal giving of the gospel in the most, most, most concentrated form now becomes a work, a work where we offer ourselves up with Christ in the form of an unbloody sacrifice to, um, to the Father, in some sense. So you, you, you turn a thing which was the pure gospel into a work, essentially. Um, and so he says, uh, to do this, to achieve this, you have to have a teaching authority, a false teaching authority that claims a kind of charismatic authority that can do this. And he connects the spiritualists who he's fought with who claim that they have the spirit apart from the word and the sacraments, 
with the papacy. So they're Pentecostals and they're Catholics, basically the same theology. In one case, everybody is a pope, and then in another case, one person is a pope. And the, the connection is they've all got the spirit, you know, spirit without the word. Uh, and he says the spirit never, the spirit never came without the word. Uh, even go back to the Old Testament, they had some kind of uh, word of God which had communicated the spirit to them, even when they were inspired prophets. And uh, he says the, uh, the Pope holds the spirit captive in the seat of his own heart. This is the lie that Adam and Eve were taught by Satan in the Garden of Eden, that um, your inner feelings, your inner thoughts are identical with what God wants above and beyond his will. He says this is the problem with the papacy, it's the problem with Muhammad, and it's pro the problem with the spiritualists. Uh, so you must rest on the uh, word of the sacraments and not be what he calls an enthusiast, a god withinist, essentially. Yeah. Um, and again, that is the problem to this day. That is the problem to this day. Words mean what they mean. <laughs> uh, and not what you read behind them, right? Because you've got the spirit, or you have human reason, or you have your emotions. You, you really want to do something that way, and that becomes the basis of being able to reject God's commandments, right? Which is essentially what we have in our culture. Uh, so I think, I think that that's a smashing our argument. It's a great argument yeah. to go actually on. Uh, in my scripture book, actually, which may come out at some point, uh, if any comments ever get back to me, uh, I, I go actually on at length, uh, some of argument uh, at this point. Um, then, of course, as an appendix on the small cult programs, we have uh, Melanchthon uh, write uh, his treatise on the power and primacy uh, of the Pope where um, uh, he wants to take a little bit of a softer line towards the papacy and not kind of pour out all this news about it being the dragon's tail and all that sort of thing. Uh, he writes actually, when he signs on to his small cult articles, he says, um, I agree with everything, but just to be clear, if the Pope would just let us do our thing, I would be on board with that. So uh, a little bit not wanting to sign on to Luther's abuse of the papacy quite as much. But he writes in the uh, good argument, I think, gets the papacy in the, in the treatise. Uh, sometimes, by the way, uh, in church constitutions, it won't be listed because it was considered an appendix onto the small cult articles. Actually, uh, a friend of mine on Facebook was wondering the other day why in his church constitution this wasn't mentioned, as I pointed out, it frequently isn't mentioned because this seems part of the small cult articles. But basically, what Melanchthon does here is he goes through the history of the church as it was available to him in the 16th century and largely gives a fairly accurate history of the papacy, mainly that. A lot of people in the early church fought pretty highly of the Bishop of Rome and the Roman Church, but there was never, prior to the fifth century, any ideas that the Pope was a magical person who somehow had the right to control the entire church. At best, the, uh, you have uh, the um, uh, argument between uh, Cyprian and then uh, Pope Stephen where Stephen quotes Matthew 16 in favor of him being able to sort of let bishops back into the church who had uh, apostatized during periods of persecution. Then later at the Council of Nicaea, if you read the canons, there's a Nicene Creed, but then there's also canons about how you do, uh, how you, um, you know, various laws about the church. Um, they were trying to figure out how you overcame something called the Miletian schism, as well as uh, how you deal with the aftermath of some of the persecutions that had gone on, reconcile people with the church. But it says that the Bishop of Rome, uh, he has traditionally worked out problems between people in the Western Church. If there's two prelates who have disagreements with each other, he can judge between them. So he can serve that, continue to serve that role. And then the Patriarch of, of um, Alexandria can do the same thing in the East. Right? So Melanchthon says, look, if the Pope has any kind of control over the Western Church, it's because it was given to him by human right. In other words, an arrangement that human beings can didn't uh, go into his hands because um, uh, everybody somehow recognized the Bishop of Rome as the head of the whole church. So uh, this is a very effective argument, I think, in the 16th century because basically, if you, took, if you read Catholic Columbus back then, the understanding is that the Catholic Church, as it existed in the 16th century, just sort of fell out of the sky in the you know, first century or something like that. So, uh, modern Catholics would probably accept all this, but they would say the process of the development of these offices was a work of the Holy Spirit in itself. So one of my professors at Marquette 
told me, yeah, we know that Matthew 16 doesn't teach the papacy, that's fine, but the Holy Spirit used that interpretation of Matthew 16 to cause us to build the papacy. And so now that it exists, we know the Holy Spirit wants it. So let's just do what the Pope says. So. Okay. She was, a, she was in town two weeks ago, so I didn't find that very convincing. So. By the way, this is called the theory of the development of doctrine. So in the, in the first generation of the Reformation, the argument is, um, you know, the reformers press the claims of the scriptures against the Catholic Church. Um, they say, oh yes, but we also believe in tradition. So there was an unwritten tradition that came down from the apostles that teach all the stuff that we believe in, which the Lutherans then respond to by going to the church fathers and not finding any of the traditions they're talking about. Okay? And then they say, in by the early 17th century, well, we're in big trouble, so development of doctrine. So yeah, stuff, that, none of that stuff was really taught in the early church, but the seeds of doctrine were there, okay? And even if you can't really like see how the seeds of doctrine were there, it was always implicitly there. And so if, a, if you know, the Holy Spirit was working to develop things, to which we can respond, okay, so we've said that you had changed the doctrine of the church. Now you're admitting to it, but it's okay because God made you do it. Okay, so not a very So, but to them, it's, you know, crap job. Anyways, okay, so that's the treatise. And then he also deals with, the, by the way, uh, the, the issue of the um, royal priesthood. Because he says, look, the papacy and all it's the cardinals and the bishops, they came about by human right. These were, these were, these gradually historically developed. Human beings came up with these institutions. Jesus didn't establish any of this stuff. And so you, as the priesthood of believers, if your pastor... Um, is teaching contrary to the word of God, you may call him to the carpet, and if the bishops are going to persecute evangelical pastors, then you just stand right up to them, okay? And don't, um, you know, let them persecute your pastors, essentially. So, um, so that's uh, the treatise. Okay, let's talk about, uh, now things will get interesting. We'll start developing off into the direction of the uh, controversies that will swirl around Lutheranism in the Second and, and third generations. By the way, any questions yet? Am I? I'm not boring you too much yet. So uh, let's talk about the development in, in who Philip Melanchthon is and some of the developments in his um, theology that began to create some ruptures in the uh, in the in, in, within the Lutheran camp. Okay, as you have already discerned a little bit, uh, Melanchthon is not very happy with. Uh, the direction that Luther's going. Luther uh, thinks he thinks that Luther is too kind of violent a temper, and he's too polemical, and he's going to all these meetings uh, with the Catholics and trying to reconcile with them. And he thinks that some kind of reconciliation uh, is possible. He's okay. A couple things to, to note about him uh, in terms of his development of Lutheran university education and how debates go on. First of all, uh, before he got involved in the Reformation as a, as a young man, in his early 20s, really. So he's born in 1497, and he joins the faculty at Wittenberg in um, uh, 1519. Okay, wow. so he's, uh, he's, he's 21, 22 years old. Okay. He's uh, the nephew of a guy named Roy Klund, who's a genius at Hebrew, and he reintroduces the, the teaching of Hebrew at some German universities. And his goal is to edit the works of Aristotle before he gets involved with theology. Aristotle was, in the medieval church, the state of the art, ethics, political theory, uh, science, and everything else. Okay? Aristotle wrote about everything. Okay? And so the problem was uh, that they got kind of a garbled Aristotle. Um, the Aristotle they had was based on Arab translation, Arabic translations into Latin. Because when Christians reconquered areas of Europe that had been taken over by the Muslims, the Muslims left over huge libraries where Christians were able to get things like Arabic, oh, um, algebra out of them. They got local Jews to help them translate it all into Latin. And they found the works of Aristotle with, of course, um, uh, Muslim philosophers' commentary like Avicenna and Averroes and people like this. So the medieval Aristotle wasn't the original Aristotle, and the humanists knew this because you had an, a Latin translation of a Arab translation of a Greek translation overlaid with uh, Muslim philosophical commentary or Thomas Aquinas or something like that. And so uh, since uh, now you have these Greeks coming in from the East because of the Muslim invasions in the East, bringing with them the Greek 
works of not only Aristotle, but also Plato and a lot of like the Stoics and other great ancient philosophers, you could get the original Greek versions of this. So he wanted to purify Aristotle, get back to the original Aristotle, past all the commentaries, past all the verbal translations, and edit this edition, all these editions of Aristotle. Uh, he continued to do this. Uh, he didn't really uh, do the critical edition, but he wrote introductions and commentaries on some of Aristotle's works as a basis of education of Wittenberg. Luther wanted to base Wittenberg's educational system on the Bible, but the Bible doesn't, it doesn't talk about every subject, of course. So uh, the introductions then that Melanchthon wrote and his model of education in the university based on Aristotle became how all German Lutherans did university education up until about the 18th century when Aristotle was thrown out largely because the scientific revolution just proves about 60% of them, right? So, um, so that's important. And so, too, when, by the way, when we get to these uh, arguments that Lutherans are having in the second generation, they're all arguing in Aristotelian categories because they were all Melanchthon students. Even the ones that don't like Melanchthon, they were his students, so they think the way that Melanchthon taught them how to think. Okay? And you know, all those great big Jan Gerhard volumes that uh, Ben Mays worked on, right? That's all in Aristotelian categories. Uh, uh, Gerhard will say, there's four causes of baptism, the formal cause, the material cause, the instrumental cause, and the final cause. That's Aristotle's categories okay, of cause. Okay. Um, they're probably more popular if people had read Aristotle, right? <laughs> Good argument. Uh, secondly, he is interested in rhetorical criticism from the Renaissance, from Renaissance rhetorical criticism, and so he uses uh, a method of rhetorical criticism to develop uh, Protestant systematic theology. Uh, called the Loci Method. A guy by the name of Rudolf Agricola in the 15th century uh, in, uh, came up with a, a theory of how you got the best arguments from classical authors called the Seats of Rhetoric. Okay? Um, and so you find classical authors like Cicero and people like that, and they came up with great arguments. And so the passages where they were really arguing well, those, those were passages that you could pull out and use as a model for argumentation for your students. Erasmus gets a hold of this and then it filters in through. Melanchthon, who takes it over as a way that you do systematic theology. And so now into the seats of rhetoric, he talks about the seats of doctrine in the Bible. Seats of doctrine. Uh, now, the seats of doctrine are the clear passages that teach the specific doctrines of the faith. And if you want to write a textbook, um, which you refer to as loca, loci communis theologicae, theological topics or theological commonplaces, you gather together all these clear, grammatically clear passages, okay, from the Bible, let's say about baptism, and you compare them, and you allow them to kind of interpret one another, which is good because inter all interpreters have a tendency of reading their own thoughts into a passage, okay, and so you allow the passages to interpret one another, okay, and so then you get your, your doctrine of baptism on the basis of that, right? Um, uh, it's a really effective way of doing uh, um, uh, dogmatics. Uh, so, and then, by the way, this is how Lutherans will do theology, and yet yeah, until through early, early 18th, um, the early 18th uh, century. Uh, he also uh, found it important to study philosophy. There was a great book about him to study philosophy called The Transformation of Natural Philosophy, which is about him. Science, and then, of course, the original languages of faith. Science, in, in his case, being, um, among other things, astrology. So, he believed in astrology. Pastor North was talking about how silly it was to believe in astrology. I think it was certainly a few months ago. And two out of three of the authors of Lutheran Confession not only believed in astrology, but they practiced astrology. Martin <laughs> 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 <Wow. laughs> Chemnitz, one of the authors of the Roman Concord, or one of the chief ones, was court astrologer for um, uh, a duke in northern Egypt, so he believed in astrology. Luther didn't believe in astrology, but he believed in witches, so he made up for Fourthly, he also emphasized the Catholicity of the faith as being an important apologetic tool. Going back to the ancient councils and quoting the Church Father, you'll see him do this all through the confessional writings that he's responsible for. Luther early on does this, but then when he encounters Bingley and the other Reformed people, they use passages from the Church Fathers to argue for the symbolic view of the Lord's Supper, and he starts souring on this, uh, this, this, uh, this view. He does, of course, affirm the ancient councils. He writes wonderful Trinitarian treatises. Disputations late in life, and um, also a book called the, um, the On the Council of the Church, where he goes to the ancient councils. But he doesn't like this particular uh, formal apologetic. But this apologetic thing gets carried through 
uh, well into the 17th century with various uh, Lutheran authors, including Jan Gerhardt and uh, uh, Martin Cummings and other uh, people uh, like that. So, uh, so he's really, Melanchthon is really kind of the, the uh, source of, uh, of this. Okay, but Melanchthon in the 1530s and in the 1540s starts growing in his doubts regarding some of Luther's positions. Um, first of all, he starts getting worried about Luther's talk of the bondage of the will, the idea that we're incapacitated by sin. Now, there was a local pastor near Wittenberg that committed suicide in about the mid-1530s, and he did so because he was convinced that he wasn't predestined and that he couldn't do anything about it, okay? And so, and Lincoln's also very nervous because one of the things that's coming in with the Renaissance is ancient philosophies that were very, very deterministic, okay? Like Stoicism, if you know, if you take my history philosophy class, but Stoicism was all about everything was basically predetermined. And a lot of people really liked Stoicism. And so he's getting nervous about talk of the bondage of the will and God's uh, choice of uh, people to salvation and so forth. And so as a way of kind of counteracting this a little bit, he introduces the human will as one of the causes of conversion in his Les Icomenos. That's a systematic theology textbook, okay, of 1535. He wrote one in 1521 and he kept on revising it until adding stuff on to it. Okay. And so he adds the human will as one of the causes of conversion. Earlier it was just the Word and the Holy Spirit which convert us. But then he adds in the human will. And what he seems to imply is that the human will, that the Word and the Spirit are only effective if the human will like makes some kind of free choice in accordance with it. Now he was talked to about this uh, by other university faculty and Luther, but he insisted that he didn't really mean anything by it. Uh, revolutionary, just that. We, you know, certainly do choose to have faith under the influence of the Word of the Spirit, but he doesn't seem to be entirely honest. He seems to be drifting away from Luther's position, the one that gave more money to free will. He also becomes increasingly skeptical of Luther's doctrine of the Lord's Supper. Now, um, uh, he never went fully over to rejecting the idea of the real presence. It doesn't seem like. But after about the 1540s, he starts to increasingly... Um, be very nervous about this, uh, not least because, remember he emphasizes the Catholicity of the faith, that what the Lutherans were teaching was in accordance with the ancient church taught, and the Reformed theologians came up with these big compendiums of statements that sounded like they were teaching more of a spiritual or symbolic view from the early church. And so he was worried about this, that maybe the Lutherans weren't completely Catholic on this particular issue, and so what he increasingly emphasizes is the person of Christ is present in the Lord's Supper. But he, he gets increasingly not very clear about whether or not the substance of Christ's body and blood are really present or not. Um, okay, and this leads him to, da -da -da, to start writing the Oxford Confession in 1540 and 1542. So he modifies sections so that people are able to maybe give people a little bit more legal room to you know, sign on. So this is the original. Of the Supper of the Lord they teach, that is the Lutherans, and the body and blood of Christ are truly present and distributed to those who eat the, the supper of the Lord, and they reject those who teach otherwise. Well, pretty clear. Um, though, actually, you can get transubstantiation out of that, which is why the Catholics didn't actually reject it this one, right? Um, Luther clarifies things, and the Catechism, of course, is small articles. But... Now, here is the um, Confessio Augustana Variantas, so this is the modified version. Concerning the Lord's Supper, they teach, with bread and wine are truly exhibited the body and blood of Christ to those who eat. Mm -hmm. What does that mean exactly? Well, who knows? But Calvin thought it was okay, so he signed it. So, um, mm -hmm. so anyways. By the way, so that's why when we commission like Sunday school teachers, we say the unaltered on school confession uh, when we list off, because many of our Sunday school teachers I know are tempted to sign on to the very altar. <laughs> <laughs> so they want to put up to me in any of those classes, but... Uh, <laughs> okay, so Melanchthon is drifting off the reservation a bit, okay, and by the end, he increasingly, again, feels pressure, because he's, he, he had, he's, there's a great book called Melanchthon in Europe, actually taught, uh, written by Karen Moore, or edited by Karen Moore, who teaches over at uh, Calvin, uh, where he's, he's, he's corresponding with all these people, Calvin and and all these reformed theologians, and he's this intellectual about town. And at the same time, he's negotiating with the Catholics continuously during this period. There's all kinds of problems, which I don't have time to go into, where he's meeting with these people. 
trying to come up with formulas to keep the show together. But it just doesn't have to work out. Another problem arises with Philip Professor. Now, Philip Professor, remember, he uh, takes all this initiative of starting a small cult, I believe. Uh, but he has a lot of personal problems, specifically with his marriage, which is why he doesn't receive the Lord's Supper. He's in a state of moral sin. How so? Uh, he comes to Luther and says, I've got a problem. My wife is an alcoholic, she smells bad, and she has a terrible temper. So I hate being married to her, and I hate her, okay? So I'm having an affair that's been going on for decades with Matilda, who's sort of her lady in waiting. So what do I do about this? Okay. I don't receive the word supper because I know I'm in the state of and how are we going to fix this? Luther uh, talks it over with the other people, and he says, well, you know, the patriarchs, they had multiple wives, and they went to heaven, right? I mean, he, I mean, I know it's against the laws of the empire, so let's keep it secret, but we'll, why don't we just have him marry the second person? Now, granted, this is not ideal, because we're going to be ideal, but why don't we just do that, okay? So he secretly has then Philip married to the woman he's having an affair with, okay? Um, now, it would have worked out, too, but then she uh, started calling, uh, wanting to be kind of, you know, the, um, what would it be, like a duchess? I mean, uh, land bravest? I don't know how to do it. But anyway, she wore a crown in public, and so people started realizing that there was a problem, and uh, he gets in trouble because this is illegal. This is against the law, <laughs> and the, the penalty is the death penalty, right? Okay. So this is a really big problem. Not only does, does Luther look terrible having agreed to something so flaky, but uh, the uh, emperor calls Philip and says, "Okay, you're starting this whole like military alliance thing, you know, and I could kill you, but here's the deal: like I won't." executed, but in response, if I attack the other Lutherans, you have to just stand there and not do anything, okay? So he, he really, really ends up weakening the alliance, okay, that all of them have, which, as you will see, is a bit of a problem. I had a friend who actually uh, uh, had a parody of uh, Brothers of John that fast. He started a Facebook group called Brothers of the Full of Best um, I decided not to join. <laughs> <laughs> So, 1540s, things fall apart, right? Um, first of all, we have the Council of Trent uh, move, uh, meet for the first time in 1545. The Council of Trent was the papal response to the constant questions about when are we going to get a council. Uh, well, the conditions the Lutherans had was a council on German soil, um, a free council not dominated by the papacy, okay? But that didn't really materialize. Um, the Pope had several ideas. Uh, first he wanted Mantua, and then um, sort of, Trent is sort of in the Alps, so sort of you could argue it was a German territory, but uh, not really. Um, he wanted Mantua because uh, there was a sufficient number of um, gambling tents and then prostitutes to keep everybody happy, <laughs> keep them there. Renaissance cities would have gambling tents all around them, so, uh, and so they spent, the bishops at the time, they spent the bulk of the time with the prostitutes and also with gambling, so uh, that would entertain them. Trent is up in the mountains, and it's cold, and there weren't enough prostitutes for everybody, and uh, no kind of gambling. So people would show up for a few months, and then they'd leave, which is why it took so long. It took about 20 years to hammer out everything. So, And then the people who showed up were followers of Thomas Aquinas, which is why Thomas Aquinas then became the main theologian of the Catholic Church, incidentally. So anyways, so Council of Trent starts up. Luther then dies. Uh, the next year, he's, he's, he's actually gone on business to his hometown, Eisenleben, uh, dealing with two quarreling uh, dukes, uh, or, or I don't think dukes, they're just local noblemen, a little lower than dukes. Uh, and um, he uh, had a good death. He, he agreed to all the doctrines of the faith on, on his deathbed and uh, so forth. Uh, this was really important to publicize because in the 16th century, if you died in your sleep, it was a sign that Satan had taken you quickly, right? So you didn't have time for a good death where you could, you know, confess the faith and you know, confess your sins and so forth. So they were, one of the things that Catholics will continue to do for the next couple hundred years is spread the rumor that Luther died quickly. You know, what we would think of her in his sleep, like something we would think is rather good, but something they would consider good in the uh, 16th century. And then you have uh, finally the outbreak of the small cult. Uh, now, if, you've, if you were a Missouri State pastor and you've read Benta, uh, the historical introduction to the Book of Concord, uh, he says, by sheer force of personality, Luther held back the war uh, until he died because they wouldn't dare attack on the old lion that's still there. And 
I'm thinking, that's silly. Like my sheer force of personality, he held back the emperor. But then I was, uh, I was uh, listening to an lecture by Carl Tr Truman, uh, the reformed uh, Luther scholar who teaches at Westminster, and he says that's actually true. Uh, but not my sheer force of personality. They just didn't want to make Luther into a kind of martyr. So they waited till he died, and then they attacked. So mm -hmm. the emperor uh, has uh, Spanish mercenary troops. He um, he uh, masses them in the Netherlands, and then he, he attacks the Lutherans. And of course, Philip of Hesse has to hold back. At the last second, he finally says, fine, I mean, even if it means my execution, I'm going to send my troops. But the Lutherans are soundly uh, defeated, partially because um, uh, John Frederick, who had taken over for his father, John, and also his brother, John, mm -hmm. in becoming the elector of Saxony, okay, because Frederick the Wise died in, uh, 1525, and didn't have the heir because he just lived with his girlfriend. He didn't have a wife or anything like that. He had some kids by his girlfriend, but he didn't. He wasn't ever married. Um, uh, yes, and uh, so it was his brother who ended up taking over, and then it fell to uh, John Frederick, who was the head of all of the, uh, the, of the house of uh, uh, Saxony, and so uh, his 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 cousin, uh, the Judas of Meisen, uh, Maurice. Uh, one of the, another Lutheran, uh, but who, one who wanted the lands of his um, cousin, basically, uh, had joined the emperor to attack the other Lutherans, right? And so the, uh, now the emperor is militarily occupying the Lutheran areas, and this enters into the period that's called the Interims. Now the first Interim is the Augsburg Interim, and the Augsburg Interim is a religious settlement that the, that the emperor decided to impose himself. Uh, in lieu of what maybe the future Council of Trent is going to decide. Basically, it means the reimposition of Catholicism, plus they get to have communion in two kinds and priests can still marry. Okay. So, if they had just come up with this, by the way, I think about a year after Luther nailed the 95 Theses in, the whole thing would have been settled and then we would remember Luther the whole problem. Because that's all the people really cared about was priests marrying and having communion in both kinds. Maybe their net vernacular religion, but, anyways. So this is intolerable, and um, people who, it, it, it's really hard to enforce. Um, a lot of Lutheran pastors are actually persecuted, they're checked out of their parishes, they have to have um, uh, church in barns and things like this, so it's a really bad time. Uh, some of them are sold into slavery to the Muslims, uh, and the Mediterranean's galley slaves, really very bad time. But Maurice is like, whoa, 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 man, uh, I just... <laughs> I just corroborated with you, not because I wanted it to change the religion over from Lutheranism, because I'm all for Lutheranism, right? I just wanted to steal the lands of my cousin, right? I mean, it didn't have anything to do with being rid of Lutheranism. Uh, and so he, he, him, he, he gets Melanchthon on his side. Now, Melanchthon uh, has been kind of, again, a little bit uh, wimpy about this. Uh, he refers to the Augsburg interim as the Augsburg Sphinx, but he won't publicly speak out against it. But he, when Maurice then comes to him and says, let's go to the emperor and tell him that we can come with something better, uh, he agrees to work with Maurice. And so what they come up with is the Leipzig Interim, okay? uh, named after the city of Leipzig, which is, um, I guess, a little better. But here's the deal. Um, Melanchthon thinks that more or less the, the Luther theology kind of stays intact. Um, it, it doesn't, because he adds in the stuff about free will. Basically, it has a very high view of human freedom relationship to divine grace. But mostly a lot of the Lutheran doctrines stay in. The, the difference is that Melanchthon believes that the government has the right over the external person, and so it can dictate to the church, in terms of ceremonies and so forth, what the church does in church service. Can't dictate the doctrine, but it can di dictate everything external, okay? And Lutherans can agree to this. They can agree to this because um, uh, the thing, the ceremonies are simply matters of indifference, right? So they're what he calls adiaphora. Adiaphora is a term from Stoic philosophy uh, that means a thing of indifference, right? So there are things that are morally good and morally bad, and then there are just things like eating oysters or french fries or something like that, which have no moral significance whatsoever. So, so, so the, the, the state can just dictate uh, to the church what ceremonies it follows. And so we should accept the old Catholic ceremonies so that it will look like we're still Catholics, even though we're really not Catholics, okay? And that way people really will be, get worked up about Lutheranism being the thing, right? So, now, uh, Luther, Melanchthon in doing this, it's a huge opponent, and that is, and this guy will be really important, Matthias.
Matthias Malachius. So, the most important Lutheran theologian that you've probably never heard of. He is not a German, he's Croatian. Okay, so he was from Croatia. He had an uncle who was in a monastery in, in Venice, went to the monastery, a Franciscan monastery, got interested in Reformation ideas and you know, humanistic learning, went north, studied at the different German universities, and then finally he made his way to Wittenberg, where he got married. He earned a uh, master's degree in Hebrew, uh, writing a, a completely bogus thesis, but it was about how the vowel markings, the Hebrew doesn't have vowels, so there's markings under the words that got added in later on, how they were original. Now we know they weren't original, and they knew they weren't original in the 16th century, but he claims they were, so it's kind of a focus argument. But nevertheless, really, really intelligent guy. Uh, and he's really a stalwart follower of Luther, as well as uh, one of his friends, like a bishop, a northern German bishop, who was a university professor at Wittenberg, a guy by the name of Nicholas von Amstor. Both of them opposed the Melanchthon on this issue. And they opposed Melanchthon on uh, the issue in this particular way. So uh, on the flip, um, Philosophy principle is that in a state of confessional crisis, nothing is not a opera, okay? So think about um, Galatians in, uh, versus Romans. In Romans, Paul says circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing, okay? So if you want to get circumcised, fine. I mean, it's painful and unpleasant, but if you want to do it, that's great. Okay. But in Galatians, he says, if you get circumcised, then you are cut off from Christ, right? So... Why is that? Because by, by getting circumcised, you're confessing that works of the law really do save. Okay. Um, so in a state where people are challenging you and saying, you're not really a Christian unless you do these things, or to escape persecution, you give in to people on certain practices and there is no difference, you are confessing by your action that um, uh, this thing that now has been required is actually... Uh, uh, and finally, and so you were actually abandoning your confession of faith um, by giving in to people on this. Okay, so they can't yield on any of these issues. Moreover, I mean, something like Corpus Christi or other Catholic festivals are not exactly matters that are theologically indifferent. They are issues of, um, uh, I mean, they do apply a certain theology, right? So it's very similar to in the 2000s, the great argument in the Missouri said by contemporary worship, right? So, I mean, contemporary worship is not theologically neutral. The, the proponents of it insisted that it was, and so it was just a matter of body opera. But the proponents pointed out, well, no, it implies a certain uh, theology. Okay. Um, this was also, by the way, a big issue in uh, the ELCA back in the 2000s over the issue of the Episcopal Church, because the Episcopal Church said that only if you accept uh, ordination by the historical episcopacy, so Episcopal bishops in succession with one supposedly going back to the apostles, then you can't serve in Lutheran parishes anymore, right? So, um, so this was a big blow up because they wouldn't be in fellowship with the ELCA if they, if they uh, didn't. And so there's a big fight over that. So, anyways, so people got really mad about that. They didn't apparently get mad about intercommunion with the Reformed, but they got mad about that. So, <laughs> okay, so this is uh, Philosius's principle, and lots of people buckled in, but one city holds out. And this is the city of Magdeburg. Actually, Luther's widow ends up going here, and Philosius ends up going here and publishing lots and lots of literature, uh, attacking Melanchthon and attacking uh, the interims. Uh, they hold out militarily. They're being unendlessly attacked by the emperor, but they hold out. And so Lutheranism actually survives because of Philosius and because of Magdeburg. A lot of historians think that if, if Magdeburg had actually fallen, that that would be the end of German Lutheranism in Europe. Okay? But they hold out. And um, they write up, uh, under the influence of Philosius, the Magdeburg Confession. The Magdeburg Confession deals with a number of issues, but most importantly, it deals with the issue of Adiaphora, as Philosius had taught it, and also the question of resistance to tyrannical authority. Uh, and they develop in this the lower magistrates doctrine, which is the doctrine that, yes, we obey the governing authorities, so no, uh, under Romans 13, so no popular revolts are a really bad idea. And they, they, if you think about it, they've never turned out well historically. But if there's tyranny, lower magistrates, so people lower on uh, the governmental chain can resist higher magistrates. So we can resist the emperor because he is attacking God's church. Uh, we can also resist him, by the way, if you were attacking, you know, like the estate of marriage or something. So, but 
specifically things having to do with the law of God. Uh, and this then becomes influential to the Dutch Revolution, because Blasius will end up in Holland eventually, which will influence the English Puritans, and then will lead to the, the will also then influence the American Revolution. So Albert Olson, who writes on Blasius, wrote a paper called The Lutheran Roots of the American Revolution about 15 years ago. So. Okay, so uh, the end of the uh, so the, oops. Okay, so at the end of the uh, end of the uh, of the uh, interims, Maurice flips. He is uh, he decides he wants to be on the side of the Lutherans. He fights back against the emperor um, Francis, the king of France, helps helps the Lutherans out a little bit, and then they they reverse their defeat and they're able to reestablish Lutheranism in their lands. Everything is saved. Finally, in 1555, the emperor agrees to a settlement where, at, the, at the Peace of Augsburg where you get, if, as king or duke or whatever you are, you get to decide what's going to be the religion in your territory. This is going to create problems because what if then your son wants to be Catholic? But nevertheless, that's down the road a little bit. Um, and the Augsburg Confession is then incorporated into the imperial code, okay, so that it uh, what is defined as what's called a religio licita, uh, a licit religion under the laws of the empire, can be defined either by the Council of Trent or by the Augsburg Confession. Okay, so the Lutherans are now safe. And that holds good until uh, Napoleon destroys uh, the Holy Roman Empire, which is uh, why then after that you get a whole bunch of uh, princes trying in the 19th century then to merge the Lutherans and the, uh, and the reform together, because before then they couldn't do it, because uh, you'd have to be under the Augsburg Confession. So, so since Napoleon destroyed the Oxford Confession, or uh, destroyed the Holy Roman Empire, and therefore the Oxford Confession, and also sold Jefferson, uh, Louisiana, okay, uh, indirectly he founded the Missouri Senate. So Napoleon is actually the actual founder of the Missouri Senate. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, right, because then the reaction to that is then new neo-Lutheranism, which of course the Missouri Senate comes out. So politically the Lutherans are safe, but that, um, doesn't solve every problem. In fact, that actually unleashes a lot of problems because, okay, different people took different sides during the interim, thinking that the outcome would be a particular kind of way. Like then kind of admits that he made a mistake, but on the other hand, he's not willing to give up his theology of Bhagavad Gita. Partly because, uh, or he partly uh, made the uh, agreement to work with the emperor because he cast the emperor's horoscope and then discovered he was going to only live for another six months, and that kind of turned out. <laughs> the emperor is defeated and dejected. The only people he ever really wanted to defeat were, were, were the Lutherans. He defeated all the rest of his enemies. In fact, there's a wonderful uh, woodcut of him standing near all his defeated enemies, the Sultan of Turkey, the Pope, uh, Francis of France, and he couldn't ever defeat the Lutherans. So he admits defeat, he breaks up the two wings of the empire, and he goes into a monastery where he dies. Okay, so then the Lutherans begin to fight amongst themselves, right? And this results in a whole bunch of controversies. Actually, these are not all, even all of them, okay? But I just listed the main ones. So we've already dealt with the Adiaphora controversy. So, so Philotius now comes out of, or Felicius now comes out of uh, Magdeburg, and he, he offers the Magdeburg Confession along with other, a series of other kind of salvos. Um, as a way of unity within the Lutheran Church. One, the people who supported both of the interims, Melanchthon and his followers, uh, or at least the second one they supported, they have to publicly admit that they sinned. Secondly, we no longer negotiate with the papacy any longer. The papacy is the Antichrist, and we've tried to negotiate with them long enough, and we're not going to do that anymore. Fair enough, fair judgment at this point. And then thirdly, we adopt the Magdeburg Confession uh, and Philokius' views of Adiaphora, right? So Melanchthon and his followers will not accept this. And so there's a great deal of squabbling in Wittenberg, and so a contingent of Luther's more faithful followers break off from them and head to Jena, where they start their own university of um, people who want to hold to all of Luther's views and not the deviations that um, Melanchthon's been through or not. Okay. So Lutherans, Lutherans now break into, in the second generation into two factions. So by the way, if you want to read all of that about my, my take on all of these, you can buy this for only $250. I wrote all the articles dealing with the second generation of scrolls in this one. So. <laughs> <laughs> only $250. So, uh, 
So, two factions. Is there a special on tonight? <laughs> Operators standing by. So, two factions. First, Philippus, who are followers of Luther, of Melanchthon's deviations from Luther on free will, and then also the Lord's Supper. And they accept a Melanchthon's view of Adiaphora. And then, Genesio Lutherans, who hold Luther's teachings on all subjects, though they have a tendency, as we'll see, of taking some of their positions to the extreme. And philosophers, they hold philosophers to do Adiaphora. By the way, they didn't call themselves uh, this, and the, the boundary between this is somewhat permeable. Uh, the, the, these terms actually arose in the late 18th century to then categorize people, but sometimes different authors disagree about who is on one side of this or not. Uh, some people, for example, think of the Selnecker, who helped write the form of conflict, was a Philippist, and other people think he was Canadian. <laughs> so, sometimes this is uh, a little painful. And by no means did all Canadian Lutherans agree about everything. There's a range of opinions, essentially. So. Nevertheless, by the way, the, the terms in which they'll, they'll carry on these debates are the length of terms, because again, they're all his students, and they've learned all of his methods. So, uh, so that will essentially define a lot of the, the character form of content. Basically, the length of method, Luther's content. So that's what's Okay, so we'll begin by mentioning some of the antinomian uh, controversies that break out, and then move on to other things. The first antinomian controversies that we should mention, uh, that, but which are in fact dealt with in the formula of uh, Concord, break out in the 1520s from the 1530s, while Melanchthon and Luther are still together and still alive. Uh, by the way, the name of Johann and Grickelon, not to be confused with the Rudolf of Grickelon who I mentioned earlier, um, makes the argument that the law has only a civil use. In other words, it's only good for the courtroom, as he puts it, uh, and that the church should not teach the law. Uh, the church should simply preach the gospel, and then people will feel so much love for God that they'll want to repent on their own. Okay. Now, if you think about this, that kind of makes some sense in light of what Luther talked about uh, in the um, 95 Thesis, because he said the only real repentance, real repentance, is contrition. And contrition means repentance out of heartfelt love for God, and we come to love God through the gospel. And so you can see how he would make a kind of inference from Luther's position on this particular issue. Now Melanchthon um, hates this position. Initially, Luther's like, well, I don't know. I mean, you, I think both of you are just sort of arguing about words. But gradually, he gets on Melanchthon's side on this particular issue. Melanchthon hates this position. And he's even further enraged by Agricola when he goes out and sees all the kind of gross immorality that people in the rural areas are kind of engaging in. So, Melanchthon now uh, develops what, what is called the threefold use of the law. Um, Luther doesn't talk about uses typically up to, up to this point. Um, he talks about the law in general and then the things the law can do. And generally, Luther says the law can do two things. It can work repentance, and it can order your life in this world. Um, meaning that it, it does serve as a form of moral instruction, but that's all sort of jumbled together with also its political use as well. So by no means is Luther rejecting the idea of the church should use the law as for moral instruction. Indeed, if you read the catechisms, he spends a lot of time on that. And some of his sermons are, in fact, just more uh, moral exaltation. I mean, I wouldn't suggest anybody actually preach that way, but he, he did, in fact, preach that way oftentimes. So Luther talks about, or Melanchthon, though, when we talk about uses of the law, it's a term he gets from classical rhetoric. He gets this from Cicero, specifically. And he says there are three uses of the law. First, there's the civil use of the law, which the government uses to restrain wickedness in people and to order a common life together. Secondly, there is a theological use of the law, which is preached in order to work repentance, which then prepares sinners to receive the gospel. And then finally, there's a third use of the law, which is meant to instruct people who are believers in good works, so they know which good works uh, to use. Now, in many ways, uh, the, his account of the third use of the law, as we'll see with the conflict, is not entirely satisfactory. Because, whereas the fundamental conflict will point out that the law is the law is the law, and so even in moral instruction will, in some sense, threaten and accuse us this side of eternity. Um, Melanchthon usually talks about this as just sort of, you know, fun, good information and sort of neutral moral instruction. Something, of course, as we'll see, will cause a lot of problems later on in the question of the use of law. The second antinomian controversy breaks out between the Genesio Lutheran, Nicholas von Amsdorf, and then uh, the Philippist, uh, John Major, in the early 1550s. Major writes a work where he argues that the 
uh, obeying the law is necessary for salvation. Now, by necessary, he means that if you have real faith, it automatically leads to good works. That is true. But the language of necessary um, is something that you know makes it sound like he's making it a kind of condition. Uh, a lot of uh, Lutheran, Gangs of Lutheran criticized this, so he reformulated it in the equally problematic, it's necessary to preserve salvation. Sure. Uh, no. Okay. Now, he didn't mean anything by this, so this is really more important. Now, Nicholas Van Amstar, being kind of a hothead, responded by saying, no, good works are detrimental to salvation. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, again, a certain, from a certain perspective, I mean, if you don't have faith, certainly they will be, because you'll you know, use it as a uh, form of pride. I mean, but uh, they just kind of argued back and forth with one another, and it was just, again, essentially a kind of war of words. So as much as I don't like John Major, I, I admit that he really actually didn't intend to teach anything bad. Uh, or anything bad. But this then sparks then the third antidote controversy uh, by, on, with Andreas Pouch and then Anton on, on Otto, who are reacting to Major. So they come with these formulations. Now, by the way, this is actually an area of agreement. Nobody, so these guys will reject the third use of the law, but the Genesio Lutherans and the Philippines will agree on the third use of the law, and that they accept for some the Genesio Lutherans will show some trepidations about it, but they won't end up rejecting it. So uh, both these guys argue all righteousness is passive rather than active. In other words, a passive reception of God's grace, okay, an attitude of passive receptivity towards God's grace, not active. Active obedience the law lacks value before God. Uh, even if a person is to obey the law perfectly, argued uh, Pouch, uh, he wouldn't actually merit salvation. Well, then that sort of problematizes Christ's active obedience on our behalf, his holy life on our behalf. Philosophers had, had one of the arguments that Philosophers had made in relationship to the antinomian controversies was that if a person, now he admitted this was impossible, if a person did live perfectly according to the law, then they couldn't actually merit salvation. And then thirdly, this would be the much more kind of less theoretical, more sort of substantive. Really, the only second, only the second use of the law should be preached. Uh, why? Because uh, God the Holy Spirit will either call, use this to cause faith, and then uh, good works will automatically follow. Or if that doesn't work out, then people will be disobedient, but then the government can just take care of them essentially. So. Now, I don't know any Lutheran theologians since then who've really actually held this position, but I do know a lot of uh, pastors who theoretically kind of held the position kind of like that. So, uh, anyways, okay, so eventually this was again all resolved during the Formula of Concord, taking in, again, Melanch the Melanchthonian concerns, okay, but also upholding Luther Luther's doctrinal positions. So, resolution. Um, the Form of Concord affirms that the, the law is God's holy and eternal will. There are three uses of it, civil, theological, and instructional. And there is a third use of the law. Now, here's where it gets interesting, because remember, Melanchthon treated it like it was a sort of neutral um, use of the law that was just sort of helpful information about how to you know, live out your faith. Now, uh, the uh, Form of Concord admits that if we were perfectly regenerate, we would just automatically do the law, like the people, the heretics in the third antinomian controversy said. But that's not how things actually work out. We actually are silly uses of God, at the same time saints and sinners, and so we need the law as instruction to keep us in line. Okay? Uh, nevertheless, the law is never friendly and fun. It is always mixed together with condemnation and coercion. It's never merely kind of neutral instruction. One of the Ganesha Lutherans, a guy by the name of Andreas Muscovus, actually kind of took up the cause a little bit of the, um, uh, of the, uh, of Aunt Otto and those people, because he said, uh, we've got to be really, really careful, because if we introduce a, a, a concept of a law that isn't, in some sense, condemning, we might throw people essentially back into a kind of self-justification mode, where they're trying to prove their faith by doing the law. And so he strongly kind of contributed to the ultimate settlement in the uh, form of the Concord, um, adding in essentially, yes, we have to be careful in, in terms of our use of the law and uh, the third use of the law because, you know, again, the human mind will use the law as a form of self-justification. But nevertheless, the, the function of the law as a form of instruction is finally affirmed, something in accordance with Luther's teaching, as we can see just from reading this section of the Ten Commandments in the large Catechism. Mm -hmm. 
and to provide future fodder for uh, internet theologians. <laughs> Now, by the way, I'm not dealing with these chronologically because they're all happening at once, okay? So just so we're aware of this, I'm just trying to go through each kind of as they develop. Any questions so far? Okay. So next one, uh, next significant controversy is the Oseandrian controversy. I'll just touch on this one lightly. So Andreas Oseander, pictured here, he was a, uh, a colleague and then sort of student of, of Luther's. He ended up in Nuremberg as a pastor. Uh, his own congregation's fathers uh, called in Luther and the like against him because he was discontinued public confession and absolution. Okay, and the reason was that he couldn't tell if anybody was really uh, sincere. Right, he couldn't publicly pronounce them absolved. Right, um, and he had some very peculiar views of confession and absolution. He believed that pastors had like a kind of quasi-judicial power to absolve people, but unless it took that is to say, the person repented after a certain period of time, that it would, the, the, the pronunciation of absolution would somehow evaporate, and it really wouldn't. So he would have to be able to question the person individually to tell if they were really repentant for it to work. Now, this is interesting because it sets up how his, as we'll see, his peculiar ideas about justification and Christology, which will get him into trouble in the Alexandria controversy. What the pastor says, okay, his word, is separate from uh, God's grace, okay? Because God's grace is one thing going on in your heart, and the pastor's word is another thing. And Luther's point was, okay, first of all, it's objectively true whether or not anybody believes it or not, okay? Maybe, like, three hours later, they will come to faith, and then it will be, be they'll appropriate it, okay? Um, it, 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 but it's objectively true because uh, the gospel is a categorical statement of God to the whole world, so... Uh, and moreover, uh, when you're preaching the gospel and sermon, that's what you're doing anyway, so you're giving absolution to people. So, you know, whether or not they believe it, it's true, okay? Um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, that's the, we might say, using our you know, Missouri Senate parlance, objective justification, and then um, that's valid, but of course, to be saved, you need to appropriate it subjectively through faith. But it doesn't cancel out that, that it's objectively true. Moreover, it's an efficacious word. So only by you pronouncing the word of the gospel will God the Holy Spirit sacramentally work through the word to give you faith. Okay. So so faith, so the word and God's operation isn't like one thing's going on in your heart and the other thing is just a dead word outside of the mouth of the pastor. God is working through and actually is present in that word, speaking the words of forgiveness to you. Okay, so this carries over then into his screwy ideas about justification. Now he gets kicked out of his parish during the interims, okay, and he makes his way north to uh, Brandenburg in the area sort of of Berlin in, in what was at that time, will later become Prussia, okay, one of the major states in Germany. And so he'll develop these kind of strange ideas about justification. Specifically, uh, the idea is that Christ, according to his humanity, paid for our sins by dying on the cross. So he wiped out our sins, that's good. But, the pro here's the problem, um, that's not good enough because uh, our sins are a kind of infinite debt, so we have to be positively righteous. So, so the infinite debt is wiped out by uh, Christ's death, but we have to be positively righteous before God to be justified. And the only thing that, that could actually correspond to God's infinite justice is God's own righteousness. So righteousness is a kind of quality that adheres in God, okay, it's like blue or something, right? <laughs> Blue it adheres in my jacket, so righteousness adheres in God. And so you have to be filled with that through a kind of mystical union, and then you're justified, right? So there's a two there's two parts to it. Now, uh, Martin Chemnitz, who will be one of the later leaders of the uh, modern party of Canadian Lutherans, and uh, Melanchthon absolutely hate this. By the way, all the both the Philippines and the Melanchthon Lutherans get together and they both are completely against this. What they charge against him is that you're saying, that, some, that this is, they, they take this being filled with divine righteousness as a form of sanctification, and so say that justification is, is dependent on justification. Now, that's actually not what he's saying, though, okay? What he's saying is that God sees his own righteousness in you. It doesn't have anything to do with the good works you're doing or anything like that. And Joachim Moreland, one of, another one of Rosie Andrews' um, opponents, agrees that this is a rather unfair uh, charge on the part of the Michael and also uh, Kevin's Philosius, though, is the main person who ends up responding, again, Philosius, to the rescue, right? So he emphasizes that justification is imputed 
mystical union, our union with Christ, um, our substantial union with Christ, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branch, and we're one body with Christ, and all that kind of thing, uh, happens subsequent to justification, and justification is not based on it, okay? This is ultimately what the formula of comfort will also say. Also, he develops this idea, this idea. so what uh, about um, how Christ's righteousness saves us, okay? Uh, now, the interesting thing is, just as the word of the pastor and God's grace are separate things for Osiander, so the two natures of Christ are going to separate it out. So Christ does one thing according to his humanity, and that justifies us one way according to his humanity, and then justifies us another way according to his divinity. Right? So Philosophia says, no, the divine person of Christ is on the one hand righteous in our place, he lives a holy life free of the taint of sin in our place, his divine righteousness um, works through his humanity to do that, okay, his divine person. But then he also, uh, according to his divinity and humanity, um, dies in our place on the cross, so he accepts the imputation of sin. So negative and positively, this is what is called in classical Lutheran theology, passive righteousness, the Christ's willingness to accept the judgment, our judgment for sin, but also active righteousness, Christ's willingness to live a holy life in our place. And again, this is, you find this again in Luther, this is in Galatians commentary, but the terminology and the kind of clean formulation you get from Philosophers, Philosophers is the one who comes up with this one too. See how important this guy is? Yeah. So by the way, all this period, he's sniping back and forth with Melanchthon, and uh, they say, well, some of those followers say, they hate each other, they hate each other so much, they're, we're never going to get this thing resolved while both of them are alive, and they're going to have to both die before we get this thing resolved. So, and actually, that's what happened. Right? So, uh, there's a personality conflict as well. There's always a personality conflict, right? <laughs> a kind of theological conflict. Okay, so things uh, get bad for Philosophus due to a series of controversies about synergism. That's the idea that you cooperate with God. It's, it's sort of like, um, you know, you're, you're, uh, one, one Catholic theologian says it's like a boat being carried by two men. So God is one of the men carrying the boat, and you're the other man carrying the boat. And so together you're able to move forward with the boat, right? So, um, uh, so that's synergism. Okay, now Melanchthon implied synergism, but his followers are now like, go for synergism. So they really, but he would get only implied, they really start taking it uh, very seriously and um, argue in favor. So Melanchthon thinks that free will has a role to play in salvation. Um, now, uh, Philosius and the Ganesian Lutherans uh, hold Luther's view of the bondage of the will, and so they start kind of fighting with the Philippists, and actually write some confessions of faith, uh, attacking some of the Philippist ideas that are being promoted uh, in Wittenberg. Hand in hand with this, Philosius and the um, Ganesian Lutherans affirm with Luther a doctrine of predestination, and Philip and his followers simply say something to the effect of, well, God kind of foreknows who accepts grace and who doesn't, and that's what sort of predestination. Okay, so foreknowledge, not actual predestination. Uh, okay. Okay, so just to review Luther's own doctrine of sin and grace so that we get where the Ganesian Lutherans are coming from. Um, so here's some key concepts, particularly from his book, uh, The Bondage of the Will. Luther says, we're not completely without free will. Uh, regarding that which he calls things below us, everyday decisions, um, being able to choose uh, what bank we want or what tie we want to wear, we are free uh, in those things. Now, things above us, things that move in the interpersonal dimension, uh, our desires, the desires of the heart, we are not free. We're not the authors of our own desires. So you can prevent yourself from eating chocolate cake, but you can't will yourself to want to eat chocolate cake or not want to eat chocolate cake, right? I mean, this is true. Right, so you can choose not to eat it, but you can't choose what your desires are, okay? So, the desires of our heart we receive um, uh, in matters of our relationship to God, as well as our relationship to other people, right? Nobody ever decided to love their own spouse or not love their spouse, right? Um, are, we're not free of those things, okay? Because we're not the authors of our own uh, desires. And so this leads Luther to distinguish between what he calls the necessity of immutability and the necessity of compulsion. So the will is bound, but the will is, by saying that the will is bound to sin, okay, because we're born into original sin, we passively have received this nature from our first parents, okay, this corrupted nature. Uh, it doesn't mean, though, that we're marionettes. That would be the necessity of compulsion. God is not jerking us around on a string. Rather, we have a necessity of immutability. We do what we want to do, okay? 
St. Augustine made, essentially made this argument about a thousand years earlier. So um, we do what we want to do. When we're in a state of sin, and we, uh, are, which we're born into, we want to reject God. We're just doing what we want to do. There's no outside force coming in and manhandling us into rejecting God. Okay. In the same sense, too, when the Holy Spirit writes um, the law of God on our heart, or gives, or circumcises our heart, or removes the heart of stone, and then gives us a heart of flesh, to use some images the Old Testament uses, we do, we trust and love God with all things out of desire. Okay, so God, uh, in a sense, He's not. Our will is bound, and he's the author of our will being changed, but he's not coercing us into faith in some sense. Okay. Now that, of course, uh, leads to the question of, uh, inexorably, what, why some people's hearts are changed and why other people's hearts aren't changed. And Luther says, if you look to God in Christ, then you see nothing but a God who has opened his heart to the whole world on the cross and through word and sacrament. When God is present to you in word and sacrament, he's absolutely sincere about his, his love and generosity to you. Now, if you go out in, in the world and look at what seemingly is a result of the will of God in the world, it will get pretty scary pretty quickly, right? That's, that represents God's hidden will, and we can't pierce that hidden will. And so we can only experience it as death and destruction and wrath. So instead of speculating why things are wrathful and um, scary out in, in the world, out beyond the boundaries of the word and sacrament ministry of the church, uh, we should cling to the revealed God in Christ against the hidden God. And in the end, it will all be solved for us. When we see God in His glory, He will explain to us why some ended up being saved and why others didn't. Okay? So there's the light of nature, Luther says, where if you read the old pagan poets, they'll say, oh, life is so unfair. Why are the gods so evil to us? Why does God permit evil in the world? And then you will come to the light of grace and you'll say, oh, there's this thing called original sin. That makes sense. We're all getting exactly what we deserve. So there's no good people for bad things to happen to. There's only bad people. And so problem solved. And he says, look, that was a really crackerjack solution. So, because we didn't know about original sin, and now we know about original sin. So that explains why there's suffering in the world. Now, we have the question, why is there election? Why are some people saved and other people aren't? Well, God will explain to us in light of glory, and the solution to Justice Cracker Jack is us reporting our original sin. Right? So uh, that's his way of, of solving the problem. Uh, so proclamation, not speculation, right? It's the great slogan. Yeah. And, okay, so in reaction then to some of Melanchthon's ideas, um, a lot of the Canadian Lutherans then veer too far to the, we, I don't know, said left or the right, but away from Melanchthon, let's say, okay. So many of the good days of Lutherans, including Amsworth, go for double predestination. They'll say, yeah, double predestination. Uh, Johannes Brentz, the great reformer of Swabia, goes for double predestination. He says, there's God's incomprehensible language, there's the Father and the Son having an eternal conversation, and then they say, this person goes to heaven, this person goes to hell. And then the Son comes out and says, repent and believe the gospel, and that's God's comprehensible language, or something like that. So some of them go for double predestination. Um, now, what's the problem with this, beyond the fact that there's many passages in the New Testament which talk about the universality of God's grace? Um, the chief problem, and I think Robert Cole has a really good point here, is that it makes them the central proclamation of the church of law and gospel complete nonsense. Because if you say that certain people are predestined, then the, the law can no longer condemn them, and the law has nothing to say to them. <clears throat> Simultaneously, if you say that certain people are, in, are have been chosen for damnation to God by God, then the gospel has nothing to say to them, right? So our message then is categorical law and gospel. It means the law and gospel always are true no matter who um, we say them to. It, they're, they're an axiomatic categorical truth. That's why they're the clear light that's the center of scripture, because uh, if something is conditional, you have to figure out under what conditions it applies. And if it always applies, it's absolute, something is absolutely clear. So, uh, Joachim Moreland, or I'm sorry, Joachim Westphal, uh, uh, who's an opponent of Calvin's, uh, upholds something very close to Luther's sort of paradoxical view, where he doesn't maybe use the language of the hidden of God, but he wants to affirm both the particularity of election, that, we, that if we are saved, we are saved, saved because God has chosen us for eternity, yet that does not discount, as paradoxical as it might seem, the universality of God.
God's grace. Okay. On the anthropological level, that is the level that deals with human nature, Palacios gets him into it hardcore with a guy by the name of Victor Striegel. Striegel is sort of a philippist, but sort of not a philippist. Um, he teaches at the University of Jena along with the other gymnasial Lutherans. And he, there's a confession of faith which they all write together attacking the Philippus. And uh, Striegel's um, discussion of original sin is thrown out and Philosius is his place in there. So he has a personal anger that his article was removed and Philosius is was put in. So Striegel, who does not like Melanchthon, he was a student of Melanchthon, but he did not like Melanchthon, nevertheless is closer to him on the free will issue. And so they have a debate in front of the Duke of Saxony in Jena about the question of original sin. And uh, what Striegel argues is that though the human will is incapacitated by original sin, nevertheless, um, God the Holy Spirit gives it some juice and then it can make its own decision about whether or not it wants to cooperate with God's grace or not. He says it's just like a magnet. When you put lemon juice on a magnet, it makes the magnet stop working. And then when you remove it, it starts working again, and then that doesn't work. <laughs> why they didn't just test this by putting lemon juice on magnet, I don't know why. <laughs> okay, so they, so Philosophus doesn't like this, they're arguing back and forth, and so uh, Strigel starts using Aristotle and Aristotle's categories. Now Aristotle said, and again, here's, it starts getting complicated, he says there's a difference between substance and accidents. A substance isn't just like, what is this grainy, sub, grainy substance on my fingers? A substance is a entity that exists unto itself. So my arm is an entity, but it's not a substance because it's part of me. Okay, I'm a substance because I'm not part of anything else. Okay, and I'm, I'm a continuously existing subject. So, for example, when I show you baby pictures of me, I'm the same substance I was at that age, even if I thought I looked different. Now there are predicates that hold on that are embedded in my substance, right? So my hair color, my height which are all different than what I was being. I was a bleach blonde until I was like you know, eight years old or something like that. And those are accidents. And those change over time. My hair is turning gray now, okay, a little bit. And, <laughs> right, I'm just a little You're bit. way behind. Right. <laughs> and so, again, that's another accidental quality. So by the way, this is how the Catholic Church explains what goes on in the Mass, right? So because the accidents, the external appearance of bread and wine remain, but the substance, the body and blood, or the bread and wine turn into the body of Christ. So, in order to minimize original sin, uh, Striegel says, original sin is an accident. It's a, uh, a, a, a deficiency, I guess, or quality adhering to the human substance. The human substance wasn't changed by the fall of the sin, uh, but only an accidental quality came. And then you can remove the accidental uh, quality, and the human will and reason can function properly again and cooperate with God's grace. In order to counteract this, Philosius gets really, really, really mad, and he says, he, he's asked, is it a substance or accident? He says, it's the substance of human nature. Well, it, that, that doesn't make any sense. Um, if you're using the term the way that Aristotle uses it, because then you would say that we're made out of evil, right? I mean, right. we're I mean, continuously existing substance of evil, right? Now, what Philosius explains is that we're so degraded by sin and so incapacitated that before God, we are really completely defined by sin. But that's not how the term substance is used. If you really took the term literally, you would have to either, on the one hand, think that there was like a second evil God who made humanity, okay? Uh, or you would have to say that God made humanity evil, okay? Uh, and either uh, position is not acceptable. He also, by the way, starts talking about how we don't have the image of God, we have the image of Satan. So, incidentally, Luther does say that in the Joseph's commentary as well, but he doesn't. <laughs> a lot of these things, by the way, could be almost chalked up to things that Luther said uh, in, out of context, and then people kind of took it to like the nth degree, I guess you would say, uh, if you go through all of these. Okay, so what happens with this? Well, uh, people come to Philosophus and say, hey, you know, you really want to, I mean, yeah, I know what you're saying, but you really want to phrase it quite that way, and he's absolutely insistent on phrasing it that way. We have several meetings saying, could you please just phrase it differently? And he says, no, absolutely not. Because what, what lesson did he learn during the adiaphoristic controversy? Stick to your guns, and then at the end, everybody's just going to give in, right? Like, like you did. But it doesn't work that way. He loses his job again as a professor, 
and he then is persecuted for the rest of his life. He goes to Austria, he tries to start a university there, that doesn't work out. Interestingly enough, there are followers of Palacios in Austria until like the 17th century. Uh, he then goes to a number of German cities, ends up in Holland. Interestingly enough, he had an effect on the American Lutheran Church through the, some of the Dutch Lutherans. He wrote a church order, which then became influential in some of the Dutch Lutherans right over in Pennsylvania. So they eventually find out, again, that he's teaching the inflation heresy. And so he gets kicked out of there. Then finally he goes to Frankfurt, where he, they're going to kick him out, but then a, a, a prioress at a nunnery says that he'll, she'll hide his family in this monastery, okay? And so they hide in the monastery for then two years, and then he gets sick and he dies, and like penniless, hiding in the monastery, essentially. So, very, very sad. And that's the end of him. But. <laughs> well, pardon yeah. What? Never mind. No, I, go ahead. His soul still is. Uh, no. Right, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Certainly, I would see him at the resurrection. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, so what does the, the formula of Conqueror do? Okay, in terms of this resolution. Okay, so although the will is bound, grace is not irresistible. Okay, so um, that's a point that Luther would agree on. In a sense, it incorporates the, um, the Philippus concern to an extent, but it doesn't sell out the farm. Grace is resistible. Why is it resistible? Because God acts through means. And we can engage the means of grace or not engage the means of grace. Right? That's a decision below us. We can choose to go to church or not go to church. With Calvinism, God acts maybe alongside the means of grace at best, okay? But he just zaps you, okay? So it's irresistible, right? But if you can, res you can resist the means, then you can resist grace. So if you even come to church and you're just like, la, 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 and you're like, oh, listen, sir, then, then it won't be efficacious either, right? So hence, the farmer uh, throws out his seeds, you know, in the parable, and... Uh, it's because of the bad soil resisting, we might say, the seed. And it's not dummy seed. Calvinists would say that some of the seed is kind of dummy seed, right? So there's the external call, Calvinists would say, but then there's the internal call that only is efficacious for God, who God really wants to save the thing, right? Uh, nevertheless, there remains the mystery. Okay, the farmer throws a seed everywhere. He's sincere about the seed. So why doesn't he, like, dig up some of the rocks and chase away the birds and so forth? We don't know, but again, we'll find out. Eternity, okay? So there is a predestination to eternal life. God has chosen us from the foundation of the world. There is not one to eternal damnation as much as you may argue that that is logically implied. Again, the universality of God's grace is affirmed. The word is preached to everybody with pure sincerity. Though um, this, again, is maybe paradoxical with an idea of predestination. No talk of God hidden or revealed. I think that actually would be a lot, that would, would have been pretty helpful for them. Some people argue that was kind of negotiated away. Who knows? Uh, uh, and then, in terms of substance and accidents, okay, it is affirmed that Striegel's terminology is correct. The uh, original sin is an accident, it is not the substance of humanity. Nevertheless, what Philosius was trying to say, that sin defines us before our God, um, in our relationship with God, uh, so that we are incapacitated in our relationship with God, is completely affirmed. So, so Flashius' doctrine is affirmed, even if his terminology isn't affirmed. Okay. Uh, the, finally, the uh, crypto uh, philippist controversy, or Calvinist, uh, the new term, the new you know, hip term is crypto philippist, right? Uh, Robert Cole uh, has used this, and I think it's more historically accurate, because the, um, though the doctrine of the Lord's Supper that's being affirmed, is similar to Calvinism, the source of the doctrine is actually Philippus, Philippism. So, I mean, okay. they're, they're pretending to be Lutherans, but they're really Philippists. Okay, so Philosius stinks up everybody else's uh, prospects in Saxony because he refuses to give in on the issue of, you know, the terminology. And so, the, uh, the Dugal Saxony now is taken over by Philippus, the Ganesian Lutherans are persecuted, and the Philippists uh, promote their own theology using their own sort of perverse book of Concord called the Corpus Doctrina Philippi, where they have the variantum version of the Oxford Confession, a modified version of the Apology, and some other documents by Philip that basically teach the kind of three sort of key doctrines of Philippus talk that we discussed earlier. And they take over the universities. Uh, they base their judgment on uh, the Lord's Supper and the person of Christ on three areas. So they hold a very similar view to 
the reform mainly that there can be no real communication of attributes between the two natures. So Christ's body and blood is um, a local presence alone because it can't share in the attributes of divinity, it can't be in more than one place at once. They use three arguments. One, remember, he was big on Aristotle, so they use Aristotle's physics and metaphysics to argue for this position. They also claim that it's the consensus of the ancient church. No, no, it isn't. Um, <laughs> and they also emphasize the desire for ecumenical detente to with the Reformed. Okay, so it gives it needed an ecumenical uh, kind of wiggle room. Okay. What is the time period here? Okay, so this is now, we're now into the, the 1560s and 1570s. Okay. So it looks like, at least in Saxony, the, the, the real Lutherans have totally lost out. Okay. Now, uh, this of course then corresponds to different Christological controversies in uh, Lutheranism as well. So the Philippists again have a Christology that's quite similar to Calvin's, hence they're being called crypto-Calvinists. The Schwabian Lutherans, led by Brentius and then a guy by the name of uh, Jakob Andrer, they hold to a position similar to Luther's view, namely that there's a real communication of, of Christ's divine nature to his human nature so that Christ is present everywhere according to both his divinity and um, Berentius actually, or Brent, uh, uses like some very weird metaphysical arguments, which I won't bore you with, to uh, make this argument almost to the point of swallowing up the humanity of Christ and his divinity. And the Saxon Lutherans, uh, led by Tillemann Hesusius, and then a guy by the name of Martin Kevins, <laughs> hold a more uh, moderate position, and they, their position is something called the multi-voli presence. Okay? And this is the position that Christ's humanity does share in his divine attributes, but it doesn't mean he's automatically present everywhere. He can be whenever he wants to be, okay, present. So he's present with his church, he's present in the sacraments, but that's because he chooses to be. His humanity is not automatically omnipresent due to the communication of his divine uh, nature. So uh, in his book on the two natures of Christ, uh, Chemnitz makes three distinctions. Now again, don't get distracted by the fancy Latin terminology. This, these are relatively easy concepts to understand. So he says, when the Bible talks about Jesus, it talks about him, the, the interaction between his two natures in three distinct ways. First, uh, it speaks about a genus idiomatica, that's the Latin term, it means, which means Christ, when he's spoken of as a concrete person, as divine and human, all of his divine attributes and all of his human attributes are attributed to his single divine human person. Fairly simple thing. Uh, secondly, uh, the genus Apotomesticaticum, which uh, says that all of his actions in the concrete are attributed to his total person. So it's possible to say, this man made the world and God died. Okay? Uh, the Bible says basically both of those things. Uh, and then finally, the genus majesticum, which is that the divine nature, because of it, communicates all of its glory to the humanity of Christ, so that he can be present anywhere he wants to be, including the Lord's Supper. But, for, but again, for Chemnitz, this means that um, Christ can be, not that he necessarily is. Now, how does he interpret the right hand of God thing? Okay, because remember, Luther's famous interpretation was, that, uh, when it says that, Christ is the right hand of God. That's God's power and glory. God's power and glory is everywhere. So it must be the humanity of Christ is everywhere. Well, if it's the humanity of Christ that's being elevated to the uh, right hand of God, it must mean, according to Chemnitz, that, that um, in a state of humiliation, Christ didn't use his powers as God. Okay? So now they're becoming operative through his humanity. So in his humanity now, his humanity is being elevated to the right hand of God insofar as now it's exercising those divine powers. So it's similar with a little bit of a twist. This, this leads to there being a really sharp distinction in Kevin's theology between a state of humiliation where Christ doesn't use his divine attributes and a state of exaltation where he does. Uh, now the Schwabian Lutherans won't do that, and this will lead to another controversy in the 17th century which we can't talk about called the Criticis Canonicis controversy, but that's way in the future, so I won't bore you with that. Okay, so Philippism then, nevertheless, there's a, down, there's a downfall of it. So uh, a couple of things happen. First of all, a guy named uh, Joachim Kirsaeus, uh, book uh, Exegesis, uh, anyways, I won't say, um, a, a, um, a clear exegesis of the um, Lord's Supper, which uh, that's, that's the English title, 
is circulated, uh, uh, which teaches the Philippus view of the Lord's Supper. It's also intercepted with a letter from a guy named Johann Stossel. Stossel was an Ignatian Lutheran. He was actually the person who uh, was the guy who oversaw the debate between Flossius and Striegel. And when Philippism had gained the political upper hand, he had just decided to pretend to be a Philippus or go over to Philippism because it was just politically advantageous for him. Okay. Uh, my friend who is a pastor in Pennsylvania found a book from the 1600s with his confession from prison, scrolled into it in their ch church basement, uh, talking about, well, he also found first editions of Luther's works uh, from the early 1520s. So, uh, it was, uh, yeah, uh, so he did, yes, he found all these things in his church basement. But, anyways. Uh, but the guy said, the reason that I went over is because it was politically advantageous to me. And uh, there's also some other scrollings in the book, uh, quotes from Luther about the danger of apostatizing as a theologian. Anyways. So Stossel said, in this letter, says, okay, this is great. Um, we'll, the, the elector of August thinks that we're really Lutherans, but we're not. We're Philippists. And we're secretly using all these clever uh, linguistic subterfuges to teach the, the Philippist view of the Lord's Supper while pretending to be Lutherans. Now, the uh, elector thought that everybody was really Lutheran, and then second of all, since Philippism uh, is not a religio licita of the empire, only a religion based on the Augsburg Confession is, okay, not the very old, the original one, he's going to get in trouble. He, he, he can't legally have a church running on the basis of Philippism. So he then turns against the Philippists, he puts them in prison, he tortures them, and then, after a while, releases some of them. They all drift, essentially, to Dutch and German reform cities. They become reform theologians, and Philippism disappears. And the Luther Lutherans get back in charge of things, right? So, okay, so how then does the Formula of Concord resolve the issues about the Lord's Supper and Christology? Okay, so with Lord's Supper, we affirm the real presence and everything like that. Now, regarding Christology, there's three distinct views of how, how a formal concord resolves the issue. So, the synodical conference view, the one that you will find taught uh, in, in Wells, LCMS, and ELS seminaries, is that the formal conference view is Luther's view. Okay. Um, now, if you read other people, like a German scholar in the 19th century, uh, of, uh, uh, Reinhold Franz von Frank, or Franz Reinhold von Frank, uh, Werner Ehlert, and then Hermann Sasa, a great 20th century Lutheran theologian, they think the form of Concord holds Chemnitz view because they say um, it says Christ can be present. He can be present. He can be present. It never says he necessarily is. Now, contrary to this view, of course, is the fact that Luther is quoted at some length saying in, in the article saying that he most certainly is, validating the first view, which is why I wrote the first view. But Sasa says at the end of his great book, um, This is My Body, I can't follow Luther, I can only follow Pope Kenneth. That's as far as I can go. So. so, but thank God I don't have to because the form of Concord teaches with Kenneth's so heart, not Luther so. <laughs> <laughs> Yes? And then there's Edmund Schlenk. Oh, by the way, all these books, other than, well, von Frank is condensed and into the, basically the Benta uh, introductions to the Book of Concord that we have in the uh, And of course, Ehlert and Sasa, both these books are published by CDH, so. And then Edmund Schlenk, in the Theology of Lutheran Confession, is also published by CDH. Okay, so all these views are being published by CDH, so just so you're aware. Says the Schwabian and the Saxon Christology are just plopped down next to one another. They don't ever bother trying to reconcile them. And so, hence future conflicts in the 17th century. So again, I would recommend the first view, but um, I'm saying that there are different views. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lack of consensus on this one. So it looks like we're uh, pretty much out of time. And then they, they form the Book of Concord and the Death of the and then the Church Center was formed, and then here we are. So, uh, anyways, any questions? We're out of time, unfortunately. But I got through everything I wanted to, basically. So, yeah, so uh, God bless you. Thank you for coming out this evening. I really enjoyed this. And uh, come back next week for the English Reformation. So. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.